Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, I'm going to speak about Beethoven's last sonatas and his late style. Talking about music, one can formalize it, intellectualize, psychologize, poeticize. For once, I shall start my lecture poeticizing. Where does Beethoven come from? From Haydn's beautiful countryside? From the chaos that in Haydn's oratorio, the creation abruptly turns into radiant order, an order from which he enjoys to escape by being adventurous, impish, and witty. Inspired by Mozart's composition in minor keys and the demons of Don Giovanni, Beethoven creates his own vast musical universe, reaching from the angelic to the demonic, from freewheeling emotion to construction, from childlike simplicity to the utmost complexity. To stay with the image of the countryside, Beethoven climbs mountains, disappears into ravines, or even hovers airily a few inches above the ground, if not flying an apparition through the stratosphere. The second movement of his sonata, Opus 111, offers a stunning example for the subterranean next to the stratospheric.
In other pieces, Beethoven dances with the peasants, if not with imaginary ladies. He joins children's games and battles darkness. He smiles or flies into a rage. He is rough or refined, plain or prophetic, sober or enraptured. He makes sure that there is nothing stereotyped about his sonatas. The character hardly reappears, and each work differs from any other. Obviously, his memory for what he had already composed must have been remarkable. He constructs his music, but once in a while also improvises, as in his cadenzas, or in parts of the sonatas Opus 109 and 110. For once, he can also write works that have been listed by a courageous American musicologist as belonging to his period of patriotic kitsch. No other composer traversed a distance comparable to that of Beethoven's music from the Bonn years to his late quartets. But the considerable effort it took him to finish his larger works leaves only a few traces of violent interference. Rather, as in the final quartet, Opus 135, there is a certain indecision in the handling of detail. Here, the addition and, if necessary, the players have to intervene and make decisions. How to define Beethoven's late style? The introductory note for an old edition of the string quartets offered the following. This music is so completely independent of all that is material, so thoroughly the expression of a spirit that reigns above anything that is worldly, that it well nigh dwells at the very border of music, a music which perhaps only someone could create who, like Beethoven, did not belong to this world anymore, profoundly alone with himself and God. I do not agree with such a projection and shall try to sum up Beethoven's late style in more concrete terms. I cannot see uninterrupted rapture, but rather an expansion and synthesis of musical means. Opposites are forced together. Sophistication meets naivety. The official stands next to the private. Bluntness next to relaxed lyricism. The sublime is no less available than the profane, solemnity no less within reach than the comical, the past no less at Beethoven's disposal than present and future. There is instrumental cantabile in the cavatina from the quartet opus 130, as well as in the arietta of opus 111 and the arioso dolente of the sonata Opus 110, which you are going to hear now.
we find choral, canon, and recitative. We encounter in the majority of his late works fugues or fugal writing. Polyphony doesn't shy away from dissonance. At the same time, Beethoven's quest for immediacy manifests itself time and again. Syncopations, bold intervallic leaps, clashing seconds, and false relations belong to the hallmarks of Beethoven's late music. Another characteristic feature is the wide distance between treble and bass. Modal harmonies augment the harmonic space. Like the endings of the last sonatas, they belong to those traits of Beethoven's late style that have fueled religious associations. A capital work like Missa Solemnis and the magnificent incantations of the Creator and Beloved Father in the Ninth Symphony presented impressive arguments to those who maintain that in his late music, Beethoven progressed from the personal and private to the universal. But the roughly opposite view, that Beethoven had retreated from the generally accessible to the subjective, also found its adherence. It seems to be based on the observation that he showed even less consideration than before for the wretched fiddle, as he called it, the wretched throat or the wretched ears of his contemporaries, meaning customary habits of listening and performing. As I feel, such simplifying concepts cannot possibly do justice to the diversity of a style that embraces past, present, and future, the profane no less than the sublime. When comparing Beethoven the man to his musical output, we encounter two extremes. The magnificent order within his works seems to be the downright opposite of his private existence. Do we know another great composer who lived in such helpless disorder and squalor? In addition, there was the urge to change his living quarters as often as possible, and even more frequently, the housekeeper. Here is a testimony from his last years. While playing the piano, Beethoven, who was already deaf, used to rest himself suddenly with both arms on the keyboard and emanate inarticulate and thoroughly beastly sounds, doubtlessly related to the pain of being unable to hear. On one occasion, he decorated his room with three kinds of different wallpaper. Just before, he had inhabited three smaller, differently decorated rooms and quarreled with the landlord. So he tore the wallpapers from the walls to make use of them in his new premises. This is from the diary of Max von Löwenthal. Whoever might entertain the notion that from the person of the artist, his artistic achievement can be deduced as if from an equation, should be prompted to think again. One rather gets the impression that Beethoven counteracted the confusion of his daily life and the recklessness of his handwriting with the help of his musical sense of order. To try and find explanations for an artistic production by examining the wheel and woe of his daily rounds will almost inevitably lead you astray. Admittedly, there are notable exceptions, the Sonata Opus 110 being one of them. In 1821, Beethoven writes, already from last year until now, I have been permanently ill. During the summer, I have been struck by jaundice. Thank goodness I'm better now, and it seems that good health 
is going to revive me. In the Sonata Opus 110, it says, Poi a poi di nuovo vivente, gradually reviving. But the experience of a waning and returning energy had already figured in Beethoven's music before. After the expiring conclusion of the Adagio in Opus 106, the introduction to the fugue gradually accumulates new vitality. And neue Kraft fühlend, feeling new strength, is later indicated in the Heiliger Dankgesang an die Gottheit of the A minor string quartet, Opus 132. Beethoven's late style still strikes me as unexpected and prodigious. Everything by way of preparation, all the various portents and new departures apparent in works like Opus 74 and 95 Cortes, or the two sonatas Quasi una Fantasia, Opus 27, hardly mitigate the astonishing impression made by the two great cello sonatas, Opus 102. They still come as a violent shock, as they must have to Beethoven's contemporaries. The beginning of a new style so diverse as to elude definition. Until 1812, Beethoven's output had continued without interruption. The Archduke Trio, Opus 97, the Seventh and Eighth Symphonies, and the last violin sonata, Opus 96, had brilliantly signaled the end of an era in instrumental music, during which the transition from early to middle period Beethoven insofar as such simplifications are acceptable at all, had proceeded smoothly and, as it were, of its own accord. The years 1813-14 mark a pause. Besides the revision of Fidelio, they are taken up by such unworthy showpieces as Wellington's Victory and the Glorreiche Augenblick, which represent the summit of Beethoven's public fame. The only instrumental work belonging to these years, apart from the Polonaise Opus 89, is the intimate Opus 90 piano sonata, at once a throwback and a forerunner. The following year, after his brother's death from consumption, Beethoven plunged into a new role as his nephew's guardian. The pain associated with this relationship remained with him to the end of his life. Illness and real or imaginary money troubles helped increase the effort required to complete the work. The cello sonatas opus 1815 in particular seem to have been a threshold painful to cross. In 1816, the final rupture of relations between Beethoven and Therese von Brunswick's sister, Josefine, contributed towards making this a singularly trying time in Beethoven's life. Yet, the influence of biographical events on Beethoven's manner of composition should not be exaggerated. The slowing down in his working progress may well be explained by the greater density and complexity of his later style. Works like the Sonata Opus 106, the Missa Solemnis or the Ninth Symphony needed extended planning and preparation. They present huge, bold syntheses of Beethoven's entire composing experience, while at the same time, requiring new means of expression to be developed and tested. Distinctive detail now supplements the spacious grandeur of the Waldstein and Appassionata sonatas, the Fifth Piano Concerto or the Archduke Trio. 
but there is also a novel attitude towards miniature, with the slow introduction to the finale of Opus 101, or the scherzo of Opus 106, extremely concise forms are incorporated within the context of larger ones. Though they may also be left on their own, as in the late Bagatens. Incidentally, it was precisely these pieces which were grossly misunderstood by some of Beethoven's contemporaries. The new polyphony, which even in the most homophonic sections now pervades Beethoven's part writing, is a first indication that in his late works, Baroque influences are more evident than ever before. This polyphony turns the bass into melody, according to Walter Rietzler, and provides in some of his late sonatas, his B-flat quartet, the Diabelli variations, the Missa Solemnis, and the finale of the ninth climaxes with the aid of fugal form. Other Baroque features that have left their mark are the recitative, the sometimes richly ornamented aria, and the chacon. As for Beethoven's new polyphony, it makes his music not only more refined, but also a great deal more radical and uncompromising. Even Hans von Bülow, who used to play the last five sonatas all in one evening, and possibly did more than anyone else to promote them, found it necessary to dilute a few passages of the Hammerklavier fugue. He took Schoenberg and Bartók to carry on where Beethoven's late polyphony had left off. Beethoven's late works met resistance, even with the musicians of his own circle. Karl Czerny volunteered the view that Beethoven's deafness did interfere with his compositions. Doubtlessly, as Czerny contends, he would have altered rather a lot in his music if he only had been able to listen to it. In view of his hearing trouble, he says, Beethoven's late works may be the most admirable, but by no means the most deserving to be emulated. It is obvious that Czerny, the composer, followed his own judgment. In a similar mode, if not even more drastically, reacted Beethoven's assistant, the violinist and conductor Anton Schindler. Today, our perception is different. The late 19th century, and even more the 20th, helped to promote our understanding. Young pianists today are drawn to Beethoven's late music. The execution of the early sonatas appears to pose more problems. Contrary to the attitude of Josef Joachim, the towering violinist who in the 19th century simply omitted the Grosse Fuge in his cycles of Beethoven quartets, Igor Stravinsky considered this work to be the most perfect piece of all music. The faculty of inner hearing is easily underestimated. We should be most grateful to Beethoven's deafness if it brought about such innovative sounds and structures. The new style was inaugurated by the two piano cello sonatas, Opus 102, in 1815, followed by the sonata Opus 101 and the song cycle An die Ferne Geliebte, to the distant beloved, of Opus 98. Although this lecture is aimed at the last three sonatas, I shouldn't completely pass by their predecessors, Opus 101 and 106. Opus 101 marks a fundamental change. Formerly, the sum of the movements resulted 
in a perfect balance. Now, the dynamic developmental aspect of his composing takes hold of the entire work. The last movement becomes the climax to which everything leads. It gathers together the forces which in the earlier movements have been pulling in different directions or surpasses the first movement, as in Opus 111, by the conviction of an opposite and superior position. The rondo form, unsuitable for this kind of intensification, is now abandoned. The scherzo, if present at all, moves to second place before the slow movement. So far away has it shifted from the conventional scherzo pattern that Beethoven from now on grants this title only to the second movement of Opus 106. Even sonata forms no longer appear without some element of strangeness. They may do without contrast, as in Opus 101, or contain development sections even simpler than those of Mozart's most serene sequences, as in Opus 110 or they merge as composite forms with scherzo and fugue. Final movements are now reserved for a strict counterpoint or for a set of slow variations. Although the finale of Opus 101 is in sonata form, its imitative polyphony is agglomerated into a fugue in its development section. Opus 101 is not an exuberant work. In it, as Richard Wagner observed, passionate outbursts are out of the question. It does not belong to the line of spiritual dramas that wrestle with the elements or quarrel with fate. All the happiness, all the power and assurance with which this sonata is imbued are imparted with supreme composure. It does not overwhelm and compel like Opus 106, nor does it release mysterious sources of feeling with the immediacy of the last three sonatas. The brief adagio does not sing out its melancholy like the Ariosi of Opus 110. Played una corda, it communes with itself in a whisper, reticent and clear-sighted. As may be gathered from Beethoven's indications, the tempi avoid extremes altogether. The allegretto not too flowing, the adagio not too slow, the last movement fast but not too much so, and the march-like second movement, which had been marked ziemlich lebhaft, in Beethoven's language, lively enough in the autograph, lost its seemlich in the first print. Among pianists, this sonata has earned the reputation of being particularly irksome to play. To curb the pace and control one's passions can be trickier than to give the emotions free rein. I don't think I've ever played this sonata to my satisfaction. The tension between the keys of B flat major and B minor is crucial to the unfolding of the vast design of Beethoven's Hammerklavier Sonata, Opus 106. The intrusion of B minor, the black key, according to Beethoven, into the recapitulation of the first movement has grave consequences. Not until the final fugue is this conflict resolved. What connects B flat major and B minor? They have two notes in common, D and G. In G major, there is the second thematic group of the first movement, 
and the inversion of the fugue, while the spiritual D major sphere is given to secondary themes of the fugue and the adagio. In its immensity, the slow movement is without parallel in piano music. Wilhelm von Lenz, a highly erudite Russian state official and the author of the first comprehensive survey of Beethoven's works, called it a mausoleum of collective suffering. It serves as the depressive counterpart to the manic drive of the outer movements. For modern virtuoso fingers, the fugue has lost some of its terror. In the recklessness of its linear polyphony, Beethoven's große Fuge is even more uncompromising. Among the sonatas, Opus 106 remains the peak of what Beethoven risked and was able to surmount. To perform the 43-minute piece adequately is not just an artistic and pianistic challenge, but also a question of constitution. We have now arrived at the last three sonatas. Opus 109, 110 and 111 are a family of works, an endeavor covering the three years from 1820 to 22. What happens when a great composer undertakes to compose several important works next to one another? Mozart's last symphonies and the triad of Schubert's last sonatas offer comparison. It is obvious that within all these triads, each work has a markedly different character. The same can already be observed in Beethoven's other sonata triads, Opus 2, Opus 10, and Opus 31. As for the themes and motives, the situation is somewhat different. In all three cases, there is a freely communicating store of common motivic, thematic, and harmonic elements. Groups of works can be linked through the help of their musical material. In Beethoven's last triad, it is the hexachord, the intervals of the third and the fourth within the sixth, that binds the work together. I shall give you just a few examples. Here is the theme of the fugue of Opus 110. Then the initial theme of Opus 110. Then, from Opus 109, the beginnings of two of the variations. And here is the dolce beginning of the sonata. From Opus 111, listen to the start of the development section in the first movement. Finally, here are the notes of the Arietas beginning.
The last trilogy of sonatas was written in conjunction with Beethoven's work on the Missa Solemnis. All three have in common a new way of ending, where the last chords of Opus 106 had finished off the work in an unequivocal manner. Opus 109 withdraws into an inner world. Opus 110 ends in euphoric self-immolation, while Opus 111 surrenders to silence. Two movements in sonata form precede the superb variations of the E major sonata, Opus 109. They are fundamentally different in character. The quasi-improvised, dreamlike first movement suspends gravity. The second is an excitable outburst veering between anger and fear. In the first movement, the bass hovers in syncopations behind the notes of the melody, hardly touching the ground. In the second, it imposes itself all the more clearly, clinging to the ground, yet unable to convey stability as it remains almost entirely rooted in the dominant. The first movement glides along in a single rhythmic pattern, interrupted by the declamatory second theme in a new tempo and time signature. It has light colors, long breast spans, and undulating contours. The second movement, on the other hand, is dark, flickering, and jagged, jerky and short-winded. The initial theme of the first movement, by the way, starts with an upbeat. One should feel this in the performance. Only in the coda does it begin on a heavy beat. The final movement combines the essence of the first with the aspirations of the second. It both floats along and brings repose. Czerny wanted it played in the style of Handel and Sebastian Bach. Beethoven is said to have admired Handel above all. Handel's spirit can indeed be detected in the Sarabande-like variation theme as long as we disregard Beethoven's extremely sensitive dynamic indications.
even if we presuppose that each of Beethoven's sonatas differs from any of the others in character and structure. Opus 110 strikes me as an exceptional case. A lyrical first movement in sonata form has the indication moderato cantabile, molto espressivo, and con amabilità, indications not easily reconciled with the music. It is immediately followed by a gruff burlesque in the style of the late Bagatelles, which rests on two coarsely humorous folk songs. Again, without pause, we hear the third movement, a complex of Baroque forms in which ariosi and fugues are interwoven. It begins with a quasi-improvised recitative leading into an arioso dolente, Baroque passion music, and continues as the first part of the fugue. The arioso returns wearily lamenting, one half tone lower. Its melody is fragmented and signifies exhaustion. The inversion of the fugue then stands for a gradual reviving, poco a poco di nuovo vivente, that culminates in a hymnical conclusion. The constraints of counterpoint have been thrown off. Beethoven sonata moves so daringly between the extremes of unfettered liberty and intent, most unbridled in the recitatives, most intentional in the exertion of the will that the inversion of the fugue represents. For once, we may draw a connection with the person of the composer whose gradual recovery from severe illness has been given musical shape.
Beethoven C minor sonata opus 111 leaves me with a dual impression as the final testimony among his sonatas and as a prelude to silence. Its two movements confront each other as thesis and antithesis. There have been attempts at interpretation like Bülow's Samsara and Nirvana, Edwin Fischer's The Worldly and Otherworldly, Wilhelm von Lenz's Resistance and Submission, or the masculine and feminine principles on which Beethoven himself was so fond of expounding. Once more, the beginning of the first movement immediately determines its basic character, one of angry revolt. At the same time, it provides a thematic seed for the whole sonata, E flat, C, B natural, in downward motion. Psychologically and motivically, Schubert's setting of Heine's Der Atlas is closely akin to it. With the tempo marking Allegro con brio ed appassionato, Beethoven makes clear that he is not enthroned on Olympus. The adagio of Opus 111 is again, and even more consistently than the finale of Opus 109, a variation movement in progressive rhythmic foreshortening. Here the words semplice cantabile aim to show the performers the way. What they imply is not ingenuousness or simple-minded sweetness, but simplicity as a result of complexity, distilled experience. Beethoven composed the larger part of his Diabelli variations before and the smaller part after his work on the last sonatas. In fact, there is a motivic connection between the variations and the arietta of 111. The coda of the Diabelli variations very nearly appears to lead into the Arietta, whose variations are also grounded in the key of C major. However, they belong to a sublime sphere entirely, while the majority of the Diabelli variations represents the sublime in reverse, to use Jean Paul's definition of humor. In the final piece of the Diabelli Variations, Beethoven turns the impetuosity of Diabelli's waltz into gracefulness that dissolves into thin air in the coda. There is, however, a concluding forte chord, while the end of Opus 111 leads into profound silence. Listen to the last minutes of the second movement of Opus 111, that concludes not only this great work, but also the succession of Beethoven's 32 sonatas altogether. It brings Beethoven's pursuit of sonata composition to a close, opening a realm in which any music ceases to be.
As we know, Beethoven himself did not evaporate after 111, but lived on to finish first of all the Diabelli Variations, one of his very great works. It is not uncommon in Beethoven that the sublime is immediately followed by the profane. In the Diabelli Variations, Variation 20 transports us into bottomless profundity. But number 21 is a grotesque scene where a coarsely energetic character alternates with a whining one. As I had mentioned before, the Diabelli Variations are grounded in what Jean Paul called the sublime in reverse. I see the work as a display of many facets of humor with sublime interludes and a graceful conclusion. It is only a few decades ago that it started to enter the concert repertoire. In spite of performances by Hans von Bülow, Edwin Fischer, Arthur Schnabel and Rudolf Serkin, it was not deemed to be fit for the concert hall by many. A work that, with the exception of a few pieces in C minor and a few in E flat, stayed in C major throughout its 55 minutes, was considered an oddity. There is also a striking amount of virtuosity, scarcely to be reconciled with the myth of late Beethoven being otherworldly. Today, the work has almost become a party piece. Each generation of pianists has its endurance tests. These days, the Diabelli and Goldberg variations seem to qualify. After his last sonata and his greatest variation work, there was an exquisite pianistic postscriptum, the Six Bagatelles, Opus 126. For a long time, they met little understanding. Schindler relates that the publisher to whom Beethoven sent these pieces wrote to him he should consider it beneath his dignity to waste his time with trifles that anyone could produce. Schindler then tells us that another publisher dignified the work by bringing it out under the opus number 126. Already in some of the late sonatas, short movements were incorporated as with the slow introduction of the finale of Opus 101, the scherzo of Opus 106, and the second movement of 110. Schumann's papillons almost sound like an offspring of Beethoven's Bagatelles Opus 119, while Chopin's 24 preludes are the crowning achievement of binding a sequence of pieces together, of which each one has its own character, color, and key. Ultimately, Beethoven wrote his five late string quartets, including the Große Fuge, within two and a half years. Within approximately the same parallel time span, Schubert produced his last three string quartets. Two composers living in the same city, but, as it seems, hardly in touch with each other, created works of the highest order well nigh independently. It was Schubert's last musical wish to hear a performance of Beethoven's C-sharp minor quartet, Opus 131. It took place five days before he died in the house of his brother Ferdinand, it must have been his last deep joy. Altogether, one of the greatest eras of music came to a close. And so does this lecture. Thank you very much. <laughs>